So I would like to welcome you um, to this reading of Milky Way Accent by the late poet and educator Bob Snyder. For folks who did not have a chance to know Bob Snyder and his work, you are in for a real and, and up until now rare treat. And we all are, of course, um, because it has been way too many years since we've heard these poems read out loud. And while we all wish that Bob was here to read them, uh, we are grateful to Bob's sister, Yvonne Farley, and to his widow, Peg Snyder, uh, for making Bob's last manuscript available. Uh, to editors, Kirk Judd and Eddie Pendarvis for bringing, bringing all of this together, his, his manuscript together. And to Dos Madres Press, Robert and Elizabeth Murphy, who I believe have also signed on uh, for publishing the book. So you're gonna be hearing more about Bob and about his Milky Way accent from the readers, including from Kirk, uh, the editor, who will be doing a bit of an intro to the book. But I just want to speak a little bit of my own history um, with Bob Snyder. Bob was my teacher at Antioch Appalachia, my comrade as part of the Soup Bean Poets, one of the earliest groups of self-described Appalachian writers. And more than that, Bob was a, was a spark, was an igniting force in the Appalachian literary movement of the 1970s, influencing a whole generation of writers, me among them. I've tried to follow his example of writing with a Milky Way accent that is embracing the particularity of that mountainous part of the galaxy that we know as Appalachia, which is where I'm from, but never accepting anyone else's definition of what that means, of what an Appalachian poet should be. So tonight we have 10 or 11, hopefully 11, if Bob Baber is able to, to join us from, the mount, from Baber Mountain, uh, Appalachian poets bringing our voices to Bob's words. We have Kirk Judd, Roger Hicks, Delmarie Purnett, Richard Haig, Scott Goebel, Sherelle Weigel, Jerry Felty, Michael Henson, hopefully again, Bob Henry Baber, Edwina Pendarvis and me. Each of us with, with our own relationship to Bob Snyder. Most of us knew him. Uh, all of us felt his influence in some meaningful way. You're gonna hear a little bit about that beginning with Kirk Judd, the collections editor. And then following the reading, uh, we'll also have a chance to chat with you, the audience, uh, a bit and to share some photos of Bob. And then we'll also end by hearing one of Bob's poems transformed into a song by Jerry Felty. Um, before I uh, spotlight Kirk and ask him to, to start talking and reading, I'll just say a little bit about housekeeping. I did mention the chat function, feel free to use that. As you, as you go along. Um, I have also muted everybody um, and I've given uh, folks, you, you do have permission to unmute yourself. So use that wisely because I'm, I'm the host here. I can al always call that back. <laughs> but I, but for, from the muting standpoint, I did think that it, it made sense for us to, uh, to all be quiet while, while others were reading because we can never quite tell what our background noise is, is going to be. But for the unmuting uh, purposes, when we, when we actually do have a chance to, to chat a little bit with each other at the end, it, it's a lot more convenient if you can just do that yourself. Um, I, will be, uh, I will be spotlighting folks as, um, as they get up to read, uh, get up. See, I, I still use those words, even though we're in Zoom land, like we're getting up to read, we're going out to the reading, all of those, those things. I'm not quite willing to, to, uh, to give it all up yet. Um, but because of the, uh, some of the challenges of, of finding people on my on my big screen here. Um, I am asking, there may be a little bit of a delay between uh, between one person and, and the next. And so we'll just um, we'll just try to 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 deal with that as uh, as best we can. But I am going to be um, calling up Kirk Judd now to speak and asking him to unmute himself. Thank you, Pauletta. Um, and I echo your Thanks to Yvonne and Peg for giving us permission to work on this and get this thing out. Uh, 
For those of you who did not know, Bob, I'm going to read a little bit of biographical information from the back of the book. Um, Bob was born in 1937 in St. Mary's, West Virginia, the son of Robert W. and Malwina Snyder. He graduated from St. Mary's High School. He was the author of uh, We'll See Who's a Peasant, which I can hold up, but you can't see. Um, and the editor of Soup Bean Anthology back in 1977, We'll See Who Is a Peasant, was also published in 1977. And the periodical, uh, What's a Nice Hillbilly Like You, on which a lot of us were published. He graduated from WVU with a bachelor's degree in the University of Cincinnati with a master's and from Harvard University with a degree in education. He taught at Leslie College in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And from 1972 to 1978, he was the director of Antioch College, Appalachia. Uh, Bob died in 1995. Uh, I first met Bob when he was the director of what was then called the uh, Southern Appalachian Circuit of Antioch College. And I was a student at Marshall. That first year they were in Huntington, West Virginia. I don't really remember the specifics of, of that first meeting, but it, it, in my memory, it seemed like it was a party. But then again, just about every encounter with Bob was like a party. <laughs> um, if Antioch had stayed in Huntington and not moved to Beckley in 73, I, I might have been an Antioch student. As it was, I stayed at Marshall. We corresponded a little bit, but we didn't really get back together again until around 1977 when West Virginia Writers was being formed and he was in on some of the early discussions. But we really didn't click until the first West Virginia Writers Conference in 1978. Uh, Bob and Joe Barrett and I were all in a workshop given by Gwendolyn Brooks, which was an amazing workshop. Um, Susan Shepard, who's supposed to join us tonight, was in that workshop along with uh, several other people. Afterwards, the, the three of us, Bob and Joe and I got together. And I can tell you, there, there's really nothing like smoking dope and drinking wine for four hours in the back of a Chevy van parked next to the state capitol to cement a friendship. And it did. Uh, we corresponded quite a bit. Back then, there was not email or electronic uh, communication. So uh, we traded uh, poetry and opinions and philosophy and everything. Uh, I still have those letters. I learned, like everybody on this call, I learned so much from Bob. He was, he was one of the most brilliant men I ever met. And we had fun. There are a lot of war stories. I'm not going to get into those now, but they were all fun. They were brilliant and, and they're all true. Um, I was really pleased when Yvonne contacted me and said she and Peg wanted to try and get Milky Way Accent published. They'd seen what a good job that Dos Madres Press had done with Joe Barrett's book, Blue Planet Memoirs. So we contacted Robert. I sent him some of the poems. He agreed to publish it. And uh, we asked Eddie Pendarvis to help us out with the editing. She agreed and we went to work. Uh, Yvonne asked Pete Laska to write his wonderful preface to the book. And she wrote the foreword, which gives some great background and sets some context to the, to the poems. Yvonne wanted to add uh, some of Bob's earlier work. And so the three of us, Yvonne, Eddie, and I agreed on the included poems. I'll have to admit, we struggled a little bit with the editing of this, uh, this manuscript. Um, the, some of the spelling, some of the grammar, and that's probably because Bob sometimes wrote in several different languages uh, all at the same time. Some of those languages he made up, but we did get it together. And I, I, think, I think the book is outstanding. I wanna thank Peg, Yvonne, Eddie, Pete, Robert and Elizabeth and Greg Clary for his photographs for making it all work and, and work it does. And also Paulette, I wanna thank you for hosting this evening tonight. I, I think the selections you're gonna to hear tonight will give you a good idea of, of the depth and breadth of, of Bob's vision and talent. I'm gonna read two poems to start us off. Um, the first, well, the last time I saw Bob, was at Baber Mountain. Uh, he was, sometime after Joe Barrett's death, 
he was uh, raging at a bonfire. He was slamming the fire with a with about a ten foot board, and sparks were flying everywhere, and coals were spreading everywhere. Um, this first poem that I'm re reading is from the collection. It's on page forty one. It's titled Telescope Whiskey. What ran me to the slinky moon is exactly what runs me from it. Beer joints roistering, dim to wind, beer left tasting vinegar and sand, driving from so lightly like driving to, it roughs up the shadows of repeating. I pull off on that orphan asphalt, dead ending and crumbling white posts left sliced from old, old Route 50. Dead set my bottle on the warm hood, forming that storied form serene, all in the shape of catering manna. Swallow like some old telegrapher on the fat western borders of love, full of arrows getting off one last dip. Gawk straight up autumn's ghost beaches at squirrel nests in the Milky Way, where the dark wells blither in hell glow like a campfire kicked into mean streaks. Constellated darkness says one thing, the Via Lactea, quite another. I was the fond notch in your love light, leaning above your coarse green irises with their close packed grow up sailor spokes round the weed dots black funnel to glee. Night skies marquee our karma rama, me lost in the stars and you pitched out of hell for playing in the ashes. And the next poem is To Blossom Deary. It is on page 15. Oh, the women of the 50s, hard loving women of the 50s, the slinky smoke of their cigarettes rides and rings to the everlasting ebb and flow of human music, for one reefer lights another. In raincoats and sneakers, they greet me. Hi, Bob's Bill, what's happening? To a Les Torian just friends with stories of exes and lovers and jealous little pictures off, a private collection of worries come down from La Boheme. Out of love and bop a whatnot, they made me their historian, showed me what to feel and when and how to slide with the seasons, going through changes, doing takes. All that I owe to the women of the 50s. Thank you so much, Kirk. That's a great reading. I am going to be calling up Roger Hicks now. Hey, Roger. Hello, I'm Roger Hicks, and uh, I was at Antioch in, I guess, 73, 74, and uh, I had met Bob in Huntington at that spot that Kirk just talked about, and was admitted and, and then went to Beckley, and, and left Beckley without a degree, but Bob was a major influence on me, and I like to think that that group of people that Bob pulled together, and he was the hub and the wheel, was one of the finest groups of writers, both faculty and students, that has ever been put together anywhere. And we were obviously a tight little group of people because those of us who are alive are still here. And I would like to say that these two poems that I'm going to be reading, uh, that Bob frequently wrote in two different styles. One, when he wrote about family and West Virginia and love and friendship was much more a traditional style that, that was very lyrical and, and very sweet at times. And the other style was that language thing that Kirk talks about, the linguistic tricks and two or three different languages and bebop and and gibberish sometimes, but it was wonderful flowing gibberish. And Bob Snyder deserves far more recognition than he had ever gotten. And the first poem I'm going to read is Grandma, which is on page 27. And this is one of the poems that Mr. Murphy had chosen to place on the website to help promote the book. Stiff as a weed in winter, with a fading golden gold clasp, the purse mother kept of yours, 
so like the one which yielded all kinds of funny book money up here in the dream steep attic, opening it up, reaching in, and from your very last pack, smoking one of your Philip Morris's, separating my life into childhood and age, the blue-brown smoke doing my soul good. And uh, the other I'm going to read is Bird Tide. And what I had told Pauletta and some of us who got together the other day about this poem, and Jerry's going to read another one from, from the same kind of thing, in this linguistic stuff that Bob did. He picked up languages everywhere. He listened to people, and he he invented a lot of stuff, too. But this last, next to last phrase in this poem came from an old radio preacher in Prestonsburg, Kentucky. And Bob and I had been having a conversation about Appalachian Mountain religion once. And I told Bob about this preacher and this phrase he used whenever he wanted to break into tongues. And a little bit later, somewhere in Beckley, Bob showed up one day and said, here, what do you think about this? And handed me a poem with this line in it. And uh, that that's great. And I also think about one time Bob took me up to Sutton, where the Bear Waller was. And some of you people must have known the Bear Waller. It was on the old family farm. We never did find the Bear Waller on that trip, but we found out a lot of other stuff. And he had gone looking for the Bear Waller because he wanted to know what the Bear Waller was because it had been a part of his family history. But Bird Tied, it was a day when, thank God, no musicians died. Day when Pasadena said the rings of Neptune are complete. When Moscow told Warsaw to hey like cool it. It was a day when Bogota said it hoped to extradite a major drug dealer to the U.S. And the Lithuanians said annexation is void. Day when Dreamer said he's gone but will be back a Thursday. Their dateline Miami with kingpins in her hair where the caption said trashy and irresistible, funny, funny diction for the New York Times. Yes, it's a day when Dreamer rambles on and on in her hair-raising West Virginia accent. Well, we don't do nothing wrong out here, just play, you know, like brother and sister. But he is teetotal. Why should he, he all of them missing years? But he is teetotally off of the dope. Hmm. When what, what went down at the Baroness's and plays regularly, you know, down at Manny's Gringo Lounge with young Chico on drums and some old colored guys. Says sometimes, I'll sit in and rapping in tongues. I call him O'Shondo. Huh. Kadaba de Freet will be o we. And that is classic Bob Snyder linguistic tricks. And now I believe Dale Marie is going to read. Yes, thanks so much, Roger. You did a great job with uh, with Bob speak there. <laughs> so I'm going to turn things over now to uh, to Dale Marie Prenet. Hello, thank you. My name is Dale Marie Prenat and I am a poet and I live in Cincinnati, but I'm from West Virginia and I um, am a bit of a second generation soup bean poet in that my mother is Gail Ambergy and my godmother is Pauletta Hansel. So thank you everybody um, for quite an education over the years. These poems are part of that. The poems I will read are on pages 58 and 60. Goof Supreme. Love is bold anticipation, mostly. That hitch in your step, them green omens in your eyes when you ran up to me, brushing past poor old Lonnie in front of the Gore Hotel in Clarksburg, me vacating all mental reflexes, forgetting all my wise cracks, squeezing the tear water out of you, planning then 
to be with you forever. Lonesome Cosmosis. Of all my island universes, you, most island lagoon, ringed with hoko moko berries, inland those moko hoko stone gods, and your ever threatening uh oh volcano. Yikes sakes, you have nothing to do with anything. In the dark deeps that never join, in that cold country back bedroom, shrunk voiced, pale faced kissing, me in dead earnest why, say it. Say it, you said, and after wondering what it was and saying the wrong thing twice, cast away then on your beach in the boogie woogie solitude where the tide goes hula hula. Oh, I said, oh, I love you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Del Marie. You're our bait. You're our baby soup beaner. <laughs> <laughs> All grown up. Um, so now we shall turn things over to Richard Haig. Uh, first time I uh, encountered Bob Snyder was in a uh, dormitory or a hotel or someplace uh, where there were lots of people down a hallway. And I looked to the left through an open door. And there, seated across one another, seated across from one another, and in the middle, an empty gallon jug of wine, sat Gurney Norman and Bob Snyder. They were a couple of scruffy Buddhists. Dream of Donna Jean, that's on page 34. Secretly, you made light of all mouths. You're, wait a minute, I'm, I'm reading the wrong one, I think. Yeah. I meant to read Donna Jean's original face, but I, I'm so in love with her, I just went everywhere I saw her name. Uh, Donna Jean's original face. I see why you took such a grim picture. You'd mess up a grin, ball up your fists like you wanted to jump on the photographer for making boys what they are, high school so. Giggles, we called you. You were easy amused stopped helplessly there in the hallways, trembling scoops of snickering brimmed in your hand. But on second thought, that gym assembly with 400 odd blue devils that day in the afternoon orange indoor light, the girls screaming and stomping, the boys looking at legs, looking at each other, rolling their eyes, at the female basketball. Your shirt tail hangs straight down. What's to stop it? Your blouse front is raised, but slightly like a dish towel over two biscuits. But you stare so earnestly at the basket, cornfield arms akimbo, calm for a change, itching your tanny shank with your sneaker. The big bang keeps on juggling itself like a volcano full of smogo bogos. Left started, keeping started by itself. Yes, the big bang keeps on juggling itself and land's sake ain't so awkward after all, stealing a couple of steps on a town coquette with a move finer than film or photo. Often read about but seldom seen, taking that bambino to the hoop with a soft guttural burst of action, with a wonderful drawling rookie deed. <sighs> yes, blink and a hick town is past. 
but a JV huntress is half a blink faster when she kicks back a lean hind leg quicker than you can eat a daggone prune and lets fry, fly her raven rock jump shot so mama down low, so simply deluxe. And what it is possesses her to giggle is what possesses her to put on sneakers at the sound of the buzzer, is what possesses all us bodacious hillbilly niggers so eager ready at what we hope for. View from the catwalks, page 36. Some days it's a happy balance of steam as if every last cloud were our refining. Other times, a sorry hoo-ha and a stench too, too cruel a sweetening for any nose. But when that girl clutches the storm wire with the silvery lunch pail for pap, hell is harrowed for one little span at what her young eye might be sealing, what a faraway tune her lips be poised on. A balm grows in the foster wheeler, in the octane unit and the dubs still. And even though it's not the whistle, no, no, not even the five till five, there's a yetifui above the wax house when she raises the ball, the hail of the morning and gawks into the pipe fitter's nightmare eyes, a doze frozen in sudden jack light. Down the orchard hill has she come past the fiery main of the burn pipe into screeching menace of explosion to pass it through the train gate and sniff the crude cracking in the air. When she shouts, can I go to the party? And he hollers back through the fence, no, we know not now, but in a minute, big hot tears knock grasshoppers down. Thank you, Dick. So the rest of that first story, though, as I heard it, was that Gurney and Bob were getting wiser by the bottle. I just didn't want to go there. I saved that for another story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> that's that's what happens when stories become myths. They get that's, right. told that's what happens when all these writers listen to one another. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Thanks so much for the reading and Thank for the story. And I will now uh, turn things over to Scott Goble. The first time I heard Bob Snyder's name mentioned was when we were doing a, some poetry uh, prizes for a little journal I was doing. And I asked Mike Henson, well, wh what should we call these things? Is there somebody we can name them after? And he said, Bob Snyder. And I said, well, who's Bob Snyder? <laughs> so uh, I found out about two weeks later, after spending $21 having um, uh, the Billy Greenhorn book shipped from Powell's Books in Portland, I found out who Bob Snyder was. The two poems that I uh, want to read tonight is Billy Greenhorn's Tragedy on page 21 and Kerouac and Charleston on page 19. And I chose these because one of the things that um, Billy Greenhorn's tragedy does is it illustrates to me where some of my favorite poets, particularly Jim Webb, where he gets some of his voice from. Bob Snyder was an influence on many people and I see that in this poem. Billy Greenhorn's tragedy. Let go of me you dirty dog. It's Billy Greenhorn I love says Heloise to Abelard. And Mark Anthony smooches Cleopatra right dead on top of a yawn. Yes, yes, she rolls them Egyptian eyes and sighs and says, oh, to have been born in a future in the province of West Virginia, then I could have obtained a real man. And there he sits at midnight on the cold, cold state house steps, nestled on the Orion Bridge, two thirds out the Milky Way radius, cheated out of the governorship. Hats off, hats off 
to the great beard joint poet. And one of, I think, Bob's influences. Kerouac in Charleston. Humble, illusory self, walk honorable streets. Though Neil is restless, doesn't dig hillbilly music. Jack's home in the Celtic kingdom, like Charlie Chan in China. The junkies tire screech, the tired gapes, rows of red paper bells light up a chill sunset. And Tijan strides south on Summer Street toward the boulevard and the, Con and the Conwa River, seeking what to do with his unreal ego on the half hour layover in Charleston, half crummy, have to distinguish his raging Celtic eyes draw to Spyro's lounge, his alligator shoes drawn toward the river, his sperm climbing up street toward the country gal in a silk Kyoto jacket and navy ring. Unknown to Jack, she's chewing gum thinking, Lordy me, I hope Joe Judge Knapp don't put Dookie in jail. And Jack picks up on the blind vibes of it, livens to a Chinatown horror of sad West Virginia night. And when the silver word hits the floor, ping, plang, plong, plung, sun-faced Mason says to Moonface Dixon, we got to draw no line, nowhere. Thank you, Scott sharing those poems and, and, and sharing more about, uh, about the various poets, including yourself and, and Jim Webb and, and me who are all influenced by, by Bob Snyder. I'm gonna turn things over now to uh, Sherelle Weigel, um, who will talk about her story and read some poems. Thank you. It's, this has been such a wonderful evening. Um, I do want to say I never met Bob, but I fell in love with him in the late 70s. Um, my first introduction was a book I received from my dear friend Susan Shepherd. This is the book. We'll see who's a peasant. And um, I'm gonna the first poem I'm gonna do is one that I fell in love with immediately because of our connection, Bob and mine's to linoleum. And this is titled Linoleum, Camouflage of the Absolute. I saw your name written in a old hymn book. Some heathen called you hot pants right above the trumpets are a sound. Well, you won't last long respectful. That's one thing I'll say by God, for I know how you are. You're like the flowers on linoleum, God awful in the church house, but tea total perfect for all night dancing. And then I don't know who could love Bob Henry and also not love Donna Jean. Dream of John, Donna Jean, and this is on page 34. <clears throat> Dream of Donna Jean. Secretly, you made light of all mouths, your clever fingers poking politely at snaggled canines and stupid molars. And those whose teeth you ground on never guessed what circus touched them. Sometimes I dream of driving to Mary Etta, straight to the office where you worked, and you buff each tooth plum sparkling, buzz my gums good naturedly once or twice, give my big Novocaine nose a pert shove. Your hands taste cinnamon and alcohol, medical bitters and country clay, all the mystical salts and crystals, naked from any wedding ring and without whatever would be the taste of death. You swore you'd never marry, but you ask after me to mother every time you ran unto her up street. That makes me ponder and worry. Did your thought of life move your way after you left out from West Virginia? Your heart stopped at 22, a naughty mousetrap clicked in the night. Only later was I told how you let the gym girls Feel your pounding chest, the history of dying young in your family. 
after high school, we met but seldom. Lordy, didn't you look good that snowy evening by Ogden's five and 10 on Main Street? Grinning like a monkey in a war bonnet, your over swirl of hair right at long last with your heartbreaking small town perfume. And I can't resist the brute judgment that in, that in the coming American dream, it's your face we kneel to and worship. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl. That's a great reading. Um, I am gonna now turn things over to Jerry Felty. Hello, everyone. Well, I'm Jerry Felty, as, as uh, Pauletta said. Uh, I'd like to say to begin with, I'm so thankful that I heard about this. Uh, I've, I've uh, begin with, I guess, I met Bob in 1973 because of Barb Plasher. I just want her to know that I'm eternally thankful for that. I was working at a, a dead end job in a factory in, outside of Chillicothe, Ohio. And uh, well, I think Barb came home for a Christmas break or something from, from, uh, Andy, from Antioch in Beckley. She told me about, Jerry, won't you just come down here? You know, no. It didn't take me long to get down there. She made it sound so good. so. I, I moved to Beckley, probably had a hundred bucks in my pocket or something. I did, you know, I, I was really, you know, not well off, but uh, Bob Snyder put me up in this house right away. So that's how I, that was my introduction to Bob until I found an apartment, you know, and got myself settled. But uh, so, you know, Bob became a friend and, and uh, a great teacher to me from night number one, you know. Kept me up all night drinking wine and listening to jazz and bluegrass. And it, it tremendously influenced me my whole life, you know, the rest of my life. And I was lucky enough to get to know him well. And uh, I used to visit him in Boston. And, and uh, it was such a shock, of course, when he passed suddenly. But uh, now I think it was Scott that said something about Kerouac. And he did. He was influenced by Kerouac. He, as a matter of fact, he took me to Lowell. We visited Kerouac's grave, one of my visits up, up to Boston. And and that also influenced me a lot. To, to, I knew about the beats, but you know, he really uh, kind of informed me about that in a, in a more genuine way. So uh, I picked out two poems. The first one is New York Woman, it's on page 52. The passionate rain of the city sucks up on your window like the spattered bird of paradise on the windshield of a carnival truck in West Union, West Virginia. That single New York hailstone is the snarling pearl in the hot gray water of your mother's of a Monday Maytag. Shake your money maker. A green lightning gleam is the smash of lightning bugs under the nodding wipers of the luminous carnation bug that drives your southern laughter over your poor old faded daddy standing crying in the rain. I love that image, the, that last, those last lines. And uh, the second poem is the Poet's Fate. Roger was referring to this poem earlier because there's a, a line that was in the poem that he read, one of the poems he read. It's really the reason I picked this one, I think, was it reminded me of my childhood. Mom and dad take me to this holiness church. I listen to people speaking in tongues. A Poet's Fate, it's on page 73. Caught up in a whirlwind up into the third heaven, 
my little kettle bottom head, so coarse a grain of destiny. Slang truth, cuss word coarse. Rich men steal you blind. Yes, and when the deathbed hand of that cunning old pilgrim, who was my great grandfather, fell to the candor bump on my unborn undead noggin, laid upon me his biblical blessing, brighter than snow on wool. Rich men steal you blind. Yes, and when Pap Cunningham passed on to me his easy bobsy bobsky, me his favorite daughters, me his favorite granddaughters, me his favorite great granddaughters, wild child, little baby boy. The Kelly Moshondo, watch your wind worn stepchild, one tornado to the other. Rich men steal you blind. Thanks, Jerry. It's good to see you again after 45 years, too. <laughs> so next up is... Great to be uh, seen. Par pardon me? It's great to be seen. <laughs> good. <laughs> next, next up is, uh, is Michael Henson. I'm going to put the spotlight on him. Well, thanks, everybody, uh, for coming together. And thanks especially to uh, Kurt and... Uh, Eddie and everybody who had a hand in in creating this. Um, this poem, Mysterious High School, I used to read it to uh, some teenage, uh, I used to read a bunch of Bob's poems to some teenage GED students I was working with years ago. And uh, I don't know if this was their favorite, but it was one of mine. Mysterious High School. People run up to me asking about the athletics of Mysterious High School, and I say, Who ha! Hath not Mysterious High School burst open every game of every name in the mid obscurity conference, breaking every record, every moment of every contest? The formation of the football team is the backfield at the top of the mountain and the line at the bottom of the sea. Lo, after the game in the enemy dressing room, they weep to highest heights and deepest depths. The best baseball team dances and yodels in the field, creating fright with the fear of goo goo. At bat, they think of the strike zone only when freedom is the athlete of detail, only when the baseball sleeps in the bellows of the swing. And their basketball team, what an outfit. Their basketball team simply stands around smoking and looking at an iron basketball bolted to the concrete. They have learned to dribble with the tips of their minds. Hurrah for the Mamaraths, the mysterious high school. Their credits are worthless everywhere. And patience. Believe in mysterious high school. Lay your money on their coming season and watch for their school sweater, it is a swarm of funny looking little black letters on a field of. That's it. I think a lot of us went to that high school. And the other is a poem to my grandfather, which you will find in the uh, in the uh, preface. My grandfather argued with bugles of phlegm, said gurgle a gurgle a gurgle no one could win with him he was so full of whiskey and the sweet juice of human meat he could gargle up a bubble of cold wind whistling on a poor man's knife he made wine out in the open in the foreign part of town where the cops were scared to go just before he had to quit drinking old granddad got a split-tongued crow and he taught it socialism well, sir, they used to sit up drinking in the kitchen, the crow saying, all men are brothers. And the old man, gurgle, gurgle, yes, yes. Thank you so much, Mike. I will also just say uh, before turn, as I'm turning the spotlight over,
to me. Um, if I can, sorry about that. There we go. Here I am. Hi, everybody. That I met uh, Mike Henson through his words before uh, before I actually met him in person because he was uh, one of the folks that we published in uh, the Soup Bean Poets Journal, What's a Nice Hillbilly Like You? And uh, then actually uh, uh, Bob uh, Snyder brought us up to, to Cincinnati to, to read, actually, thanks to, thanks to Mike Henson as well and got a chance to meet him and the Cincinnati folks then. Um, I will, I'm going to start actually by, uh, by reading a poem that, uh, that I didn't choose, but that Bob Henry Baber cho chose. I've been texting with him. He uh, still lives up on Baber Mount, Mountain, which we've talked about a little bit as a, as a place for, uh, for readings uh, once upon a time. And in fact, I think the last, uh, the last time I would have seen uh, Bob Snyder would have been in uh, probably about 1980, 1981, reading up on Baber Mountain. Um, but uh, while Baber Mountain is beautiful, the cell phone and, and uh, Wi-Fi service there is not quite so beautiful. So Bob had, had, had hoped to join us. He was one of, Bob Henry had hoped to join us. He was one of the first folks to sign on but, uh, to this reading, but he's not able to, uh, to be with us. So he asked us to read um, on his behalf, The Country Jakes, which is on page 86. Speaking merely as one wolf in a zoot suit among many wolves in zoot suits, I say to you in the Wake Island bebop language, send more evil. Twirling my big long watch chain round and round and I say, the country jakes of old, subtle, sullen, awesome, acute were far too profound for the 19th century. What a mellow bunch, like a clanky water dipper, how awkward, like a pack of sin sin, how lasting, like ice just beginning to melt, how self-effacing, like a hollow in the spring, how refreshing, like walking across a mop job, how polite, like a swinging bridge, how surprising, who full of shit is pure, who sits under a shade tree and brings about the harvest. Oh, them old time hillbillies slip through your fingers like nothing. So thanks to, uh, to Bob, Bob Baber for asking for that poem. Um, and now I'm gonna read uh, three very short poems that have always been my favorites uh, from the time that, that I knew Bob as a soup bean poet uh, back in Beckley. Chicken City. The old fart sits on the porch, mayor of Chicken City. And that, in case you didn't catch it all, was on page 20. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I remember about my, about my Antioch days and particularly about being in, um, in Bob's classes is uh, being introdu introduced to uh, Sappho and to Catullus. And here is um, Bob's rift on Odi et Amo, a poem by Catullus. But this is Bob's poem, Odi et, Am et Ar Amo, I Love and I Hate. You'd meant to be kind, that really terrifies me. Why, as it was, even the way you done me would have made Hitler brush off his armband with a shitty little grin. You seem so nice, stovetop burner whispering horse rain BB traying on the window of your three-room stagecoach apartment when you would tell me your story long and droll, smoking cigarettes, drinking beer, fixing a late night love breakfast, hula hula goes the bacon. Seemed so damn nice. Yes, that's why I wanted to beat you to death. Oh, you wild child pilgrim with a piece of your iron-legged kitchen furniture. And then my final selection, night. High hill or clouded moon as I walk the hollow's darkness with freezing feet, thinking they are fixing to tear down every house we ever made love in. Good thing we done it on the mountain. 
<laughs> it's lovely to see people mouthing along <laughs> with those poems. <laughs> um, definitely Bob's, some of Bob's greatest hits and I'm glad, I'm glad you agree. So for our final reader, uh, I'm gonna be turning it over to Eddie Pendarvis who was also one of the, the editors and she will uh, take us out with the readings and then we'll have a chance to have some conversation. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for being here, reading or not reading. And also, thank you, Pauletta, for putting this together. It's been a lot of time and really a good thing to do. I wanted to say I didn't ever meet Bob except through his words. And Kirk Judd introduced me to him by sending me a letter that, that Bob had written to Kirk about a collection of poetry I had. And it was, Bob Snyder was like the perfect reader. You know, if you found a reader who got everything you wanted to say, just the way you hoped they would get it, that's how he read that collection of poems. So of course I went out and read everything I could find of his and, and just thought, He's wonderful. <laughs> and I, the two poems I picked, I picked because um, they're both love poems and one's a morning poem and one's a night poem. Um, the first one is on page two. It's the second poem in the collection after Bird Tide. Uh, and it's called Obad, which um, I checked, I panicked. I thought, uh-oh, have I been pronouncing that wrong on my all these years. I want to make sure it really was Obad. And I did find out, yes, it is pronounced that way. And there's a, a line of French lingerie named Obad. So just uh, keep that in mind. Uh oh, I hope I can see this well enough to read to you all. And this is also Roger Hickson, my favorite poem of all of Bob, of, uh, Bob Snyder's. Abad. If thieves come, baby, and steal the chairs, we won't get up, won't go nowheres. Leave the cops and robbers to their own affairs, if thieves come, baby, and steal the chairs. I'll push you down to China should your dreams fly bad. So roll on up and kiss me and don't be sad. And think, and just think of all the fun we had to fall clear down to China when a dream goes bad. So wind, flame, diamond, and the final fleece, down, down, dropping in the deep heart's peace. Outside, they're nervous. They're calling police. But wind, flame, diamond, and the final fleece. That's sort of fitting right now too, <laughs> people being nervous and calling the police. Uh, oh, and then the last Night Watch, the Night Watch is the other poem I picked. I think that's, um, oh shoot, I think it's page 78, um, 76. And it's the last poem in the Milky Way accent collection. And it's another love poem, but it's, well, they're both love of life poems. And this to me was just such a wonderful farewell from him. The end of his collection, whether whatever he knew about the rest of it, the night watch. Above it all, I'm the satellite watching lonesome cities lighting the Trans-Siberian Railway. Clusters of burn pipes on the Persian Gulf. Here they come, there they go. Squid lights flooding the sea of Japan. And even though I'm a speechless object, shoot fire, I keep an eye on the whole planet. I spy out David Booth, hey Booth, you down there in your bachelor trailer on Fenwick Mountain between the dazzle of the Eastern seaboard and the bright Midwest. Hey Booth, straighten up. There's a blue baby mouse in that pile of dishes. 
And I'm ever so concerned about the enlightened democracies and the Salibs and the light line of the Nile. Hey, hey, is that Mozart's face aglow in Central Europe? The flames across the African grasslands, Amazonia dotted with slash and burn and the campfire that Booth and Billy have scattered. A coal shining here, another over there. What a spark-eyed sight to see. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eddie. That's a great poem to end with. So that is it. For the reading, folks, we don't don't go away though unless you have to, because we'd like to be able to stay and chat with you and show you some pictures and and Jerry to sing a song to us. Um, I just switched my view to gallery view, which means I can see all of you, and you should feel free to do that if you would like to. Also, feel free to unmute yourself, and particularly, um, this might be a nice time to unmute yourself, and if you feel like clapping, saying hooting and hollering. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we can we, we can oh, wow. we can hear you we can hear you all so uh um, you know, how do you yeah. how do you go to the gallery if you go up to the top right hand side of the screen you'll see something that says view and if you click that view you should have a choice between a uh, speaker view and gallery view and gal speaker view means you're seeing my big face right now but if you do a uh, gallery view you should be able to see all our little faces Okay, here we go. All right. Yeah. Hi, everybody. <laughs> hey, Jerry. Where, where's well, John Dowler at? I'm sorry. What'd you say? John Dowler. John Dowler. I see. I see. I see his uh, his his uh, okay. his name. And John, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to, and speak. If you oh, there you go. Where'd you go? Hey, Jerry. Hey, John. How you doing? I, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt everybody. I just haven't seen John for you know, 90 years. Yeah, really, really. Last time was in Chillicothe working at that that factory Amanda you talked Bolt about. Company. The Amanda Bent Bolt Company, you know. <laughs> ah, All right. Good to see you, Jerry. See you okay. So any uh, folks, any any uh, any questions or comments, stories of, of, of Bob Snyder that folks in the audience would like to like to share with us? Well, I've, I knew Bob Snyder all my life because I grew, I, I'm from St. Mary's too. And my mom was his grade school teacher and my dad was his high school teacher. So we, and then dad was, uh, when he got to UC, he was kind of a mentor for him. So he's been a constant presence in my <laughs> kind of in the corners of my life forever and of course Yvonne and I have been friends since uh, toddler when so yeah. this is uh, this, she sent me the book and because my dad was mentioned in the in her introduction so it's it's wonderful to hear all hear these hear the poems that's great. What a small Judy. world, neighbor Jody. I know, and Dick, Dick, and I live. We live only a few blocks away. Oh wow! <laughs> and have for the last forty years. Right. That's that's great. Well, thank you for being with us. I'm sorry, now. Joan is not is not here, but we we like I said at the beginning, we are recording, so she'll be able to uh, to to see the recording as well. Peg, whom we knew would wouldn't be able to make it. I've got one. Hmm? One time Bob and I and a few other people went to the Ralph Stanley Memorial Day Bluegrass Festival down on, on the Stanley Farm in, in the mountains of Virginia. And Bob and I wound up under a big tree not far from the stage with a young Japanese tourist who was riding a bicycle across the United States and a gallon of wine. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that, that was an interesting day. It, it it really was that that uh, there, there we were you, you know just total strangers from from each other with this Japanese guy 
watching Bill Monroe and Ralph Stanley and Larry Sparks and, and just having a ball and, and going up to Carter's grave. And now I live about, I guess I live about 20 miles from the last place that Carter ever did a performance. Because Carter's last performance was at uh, Red River Grade School down in Wolf County, not far from where I live. But you, you know, anywhere you were with Bob, it, it was an interesting time. And and somebody brought up the, I think it was Jerry brought up the Beats. Bob introduced me to Kerouac and Mildred Holland. And uh, and and that's a pretty good pair to be introduced to. Yeah. I've got a story. Um, uh, the first time I remember Bob uh, was in the alley behind the garage behind his house and he and Freddie Truscott were uh, and brought me into the discussion. I was four years younger, didn't know what they were talking about, about how they were going to talk this girl into playing doctor with them. <laughs> uh, I, I grew up two and a half blocks from Bob. Uh, our dads both worked in the wax house at Quaker State Oil Refining Company. Uh, the last time I talked to Bob was after uh, our sales here had put together a, an edition on the Soup Bean Poets, which Bob asked us to do. Uh, and he was complaining about his dad, as he usually did. Uh, he wouldn't even talk to his dad when he went back home. I hope he worked that out because I sincerely advised him to. That's great, Errol. I didn't know that you guys grew up together. That's cool. Well, he was he was older than me. Yeah. <laughs> he was four years older. He grew so, up first. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah, we 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 reacquainted ourselves at, at the Southern Appalachian Center in Huntington the first the first year it was there. That's great. Well, let me. I don't want to stop the conversation. Feel free to continue to to share stories, but. Perhaps um, doing a little bit of the um, of, of showing showing the um, our let me just change that here showing showing a little bit of the slideshow might uh, might inspire some stories. So feel feel free. I can't actually see you guys now. You've disappeared on me. So you're just going to have to speak up if you want to speak up. Um, these are some pictures that uh, that Bob's sister Yvonne sent, as well as some that I had in my collection. Um, Errol was just talking about, about growing up in St. Mary's. And so here's a here's a picture of St. Mary's that, that Yvonne sent for us uh, to be able to picture it. And there's- And that must be the Iron Carpenter Bridge that is no longer there. I, yep, yeah, you, I, um, I guess so. <laughs> somebody, somebody, yeah, that, who know, somebody who knows something's going to have to answer. I, that. I grew that, up that's 16, the Hiram Carpenter Bridge, right. I grew up 16 miles away in Harrisville and went across that bridge a lot of times. All right. Yeah. And here's, here's, uh, here's a, here's a picture of Bob with his grandpa. Wow. Mike Kenson was reading. That's an awesome picture. Grandpa. Yeah. And there's grandma. That's me. Still had those eyes even then. Yep. Um, and I'm sorry Yvonne isn't here to say who all these boys are. I think they're I think there's some cousins. That might even be a girl there. I'm not sure. Judy, do you know anything about this family? I don't recognize anybody here. Okay. Yeah. So Yvonne, Yvonne sent that, and she'll have to tell us someday who who they all are. But little, little Bob's in there someplace. <laughs> there he is again. <laughs> Look at those spurs. <laughs> <laughs> now, now that this might this is a four years older. This might look a little bit more familiar to you, Errol, from, from your growing up days. <laughs> and I think that's a, that's probably a college picture. 
is what I'm thinking based on, uh, based on the setting there. And so here's a picture at Antioch that uh, Antioch Appalachia. I'm thinking it's the Beckley campus because yeah, Yvonne is Beckley, there. Yeah. So here's Yvonne Snyder, Bob's sister. Yeah, Pete didn't come in until Beckley. I was there. That's right. As Pete yeah. was hired. Yeah. And it, it, this is a very familiar scene for me because it's uh, this is this is when I was there as as well. I started in. In uh, 1975, Gail Amberge, who is is here in the meeting, as a started just a few months before me, and Dave Chapins, um, and I think Vapor was was there the year before us, and Jerry was on his way out. There's Bob with Don West. Yep. That tie. I don't think I ever saw him. Didn't <laughs> you see that many times, did you? Uh. -uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we are, the soup bean poets. That's a wonderful photograph, by yeah. the way. So Bill Bill Best, you took that one, didn't you? No, or no, actually Bill Blizzard took it. I'm sorry, I got my I got my yeah. BB, got my BBs wrong there. Sorry about that. So that's that's Bob Baber, the, the rock star who uh, wasn't able to join us. Uh, that's Dave Chapins, young Jim James Dean. That's me with the big hair. Um, that's Gail Ambergie, Dale's mom, and Pete and Bob. And here's uh, the front and back cover of one of the What's a Nice Hillbilly Like You journals. Um, one of the ones I, I have, I have all, all of them, I think, but I, I uh, chose this one because of this hammerlock on ignorance. This was, this was yeah. the <laughs> motto. The scuffling <laughs> Bob knew everybody. He got the scuffling hillbilly to, to pose for that picture. Well, <laughs> so that's the scuffling hillbilly I, I'm imagining because I happen to know that's Mike Rigsby. Yeah, that's Mike Rigsby, but but the other fellow was actually the scuffling hillbilly, the, the professional wrestler. <laughs> and that's one of Connie West's paintings there. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. Yes. Which was lost along with a bunch of others in the dining hall fire during oh, the time that I was at Antioch. Uh, mm -hmm. I forgot about that. So here's a here's a Antioch party, a uh, Halloween party. So there's Gil Ambergie dressed as 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 Don West. And I think uh, <laughs> I think Barb, you're the you're the Madonna and child as you always are. <laughs> mm -hmm. Always. That's Baber and. Yep. Baber down Baber there. And his wife of the time, Mona Marler. Oh, that's Mona. Yeah, that's Mona. Oh uh, uh, yeah. That young thing is me. That's me right there. You look quite Parisian there, Pauletta. I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> I think I I just never had a chance to wear that fancy uh. Uh, 40s or 30s 30s uh, suits. So I think I was just dressed up as a as dressed up as a dressed up person. Yeah. I think that's Joni. I'm not sure about that though. Where? Uh, with the helmet. Oh. <laughs> and then there's Bob and Peg. Uh. Bob is a mosquito, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> Eggs a flapper. <laughs> Flapping. So they're both flappers, I guess, in some way or another. <laughs> so there's there's um there's Bob and me at the Earwood Street Street Fair. Earwood is the street that Antioch was on. So that was just a, a photo in my in my album there. And there's Bob reading at Baber Mountain. I think that's Baber there. Not not a great picture, but um, but a, a one a little bit later in the <coughs> in the time. So that would have been about 1980 or 1981. And then there's the grave. Uh, Yvonne sent this. Robert Frederick Snyder, Snake Snyder. My home country, the last few dark farmhouses whisper my high school name. I'll also just say that although Bob and, and Peg and I had been out of touch just because of, of distance, 
I was making plans to go see them in June in, in May and June of 1995. And so Bob and I actually, I actually had the the chance to talk with him on the phone um, for quite some time making those plans. He died um, about a week before I would have made the trip, but I did get to talk to him. Uh, that's a great picture there. It is. Yep. Yvonne sent that. That's just sort of iconic, Bob. I don't, I'm not sure where it is, but I thought it was a nice one to end the, end the Looks like the Antioch bookstore, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Let's get that. There's a stop sign reflecting in the window. Does, does that help anybody? Mm -hmm. Does that say stop? I thought it said store. Oh, I, oh, I thought it said stop. I thought it was stop. Yeah, sir. Would say. I mean, it certainly it certainly looks like the Bob of Antioch days. So uh, yes, it does. Very likely to be. Okay, before we go away, how about a gorilla suit? Why didn't we have a gorilla picture? <laughs> we should uh, have. You know, we it's had a gorilla uh, picture. I don't think I don't think I have. Yep, if I'd had one, I would have used it. I just had a, I just had a, uh, a, a uh, mosquito picture. <laughs> so I wonder what happened to that gorilla suit. It just got up and left. <laughs> yeah, probably probably left. Yeah. Uh, I have a question to ask before we all go away because okay. this would be the audience that might be able to answer it. I have a, a line from a poem stuck in my head for many years. Uh, it goes like this, if I, if I get it right. Woman, you're so evil that when you sit by the fire, the smoke follows you all around. And I want to say that's a Bob Snyder line, but I cannot remember. Maybe it's yours, Errol, but it's been in my brain all these years. And I thought maybe somebody would recognize it here. Sure sounds like a Bob Snyder. I knew Bob when I was in Huntington and then saw him a time or two when Barb was in uh, uh, Beckley. So anyway, anybody know if I remember? Kirk, do you know? I don't. Yeah. Oh, I don't know it either. We can check and we'll see who's a peasant. Um, but I'm, I don't, you're right. It sounds like a Snyder line, but I, I don't. don't think it, I don't think it's in, we'll see who's a peasant. Okay. Sorry, Thanks. Bob. Um, Hi, Bob. I don't know if you remember me. But, uh, I do. Jerry Felt, Jerry Felt, good to see you. Good That's to see you. Series. Yes. So if there's, if there's no more uh, questions or conversation right now, I can turn things over to, to Jerry, who's going to take us out uh, with a song. And then we can certainly hang on uh, for a while after the song in case folks want to have any kind of informal uh, communication, but um, speak up now if you're not ready for me to, to, uh, to close this part off. All right, well, I will, uh, I will spotlight you, Jerry, and you can, you can tell us what you're doing here. All right, this is, uh, I, I, I texted, uh, after I became aware of, all, of this reading, I got to think and I texted uh, Pauletta that I had put music to one of Bob's poems back, I think I did it back in the eighties. That I, and you know, his poems didn't necessarily lend themselves to being, you know, putting in the song form, but chatter, this one is called Chatter Chill. It's in, uh, we'll see who's a peasant, which is one of my favorite books. And he also he even inscribed this one to me. He says to Jerry, who in future incarnations is sure to be a Buddha or maybe a horse thief or a game show host. <laughs> <laughs> so he left me a lot of options. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, I'm going to read this first. Now, then I'll show you, uh, I'll play the song. Chatter chill. On this ratty old morning, on the frosty overhang, I found the sparrow frozen who yesterday sang. 
I carried him into the barn and hate him up a hoard. Fuck come new, he was still stiff as a board. Tonight I looked up the sky, driving home the old way. Too high hill or clouded moon, one song, one day. So that, that line echoes the poem, one of the poems you read, Paul Adam. So, okay, I'll do this song. I'll show you my. Thank you so much, Jerry. Welcome. That's a beautiful song. It's good to go I'm out. Not ruin that beautiful poem. Yep. But Bob liked that. Bob liked it. So that. Yeah. I actually have, used to play that in a, in a bluegrass band I was in. That's great. Thank you. Thanks for singing that. And uh, I want to just say that uh, that I put the um, link to Bob's book. Um, which can be found at Dos Madres Press um, in the chat. If you want to save that, feel free to. You can also just go to dosmadrespress.com and, um, and put in the search uh, for, for Bob Snyder and you'll find it. And I um, expect that we'll be able to, um, to get the, the video up there on that website as well. And we'll also post it on Facebook, but, uh, but as a permanent home, um, I think the, the Milky Way accent page on Dos Madres Press is, is probably a good place to have it. It looks like Beth Mur Murphy has step, stepped away. So I'll just have to confirm that with her after, after the meeting. Um, but just wanted to let you know that's that's where, uh, as far as I know, that's where the recording will be, and that's definitely where you can you can find the book. And so with that, I'm going to stop the recording, uh, remembering to do that. <laughs>